My name is Robert Peterzak. I am a partner in this law firm, Sidley Austin, and let me start by welcoming you to our headquarters here in New York. Uh, Isaac Stonefish is an international affairs journalist uh, and a senior fellow at the Asia Society. Uh, he had previously been with, and he's on sabbatical from, Foreign Policy Magazine, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, and spent seven years living in China and became a Mandarin speaker, which I confess I'm not, so I feel uh, very honored to be in his presence. Uh, what we'd like to talk to you about today is the importance of Chinese-U.S. relations with respect to Korea. Now, if we have the U.S.-China Relations Committee here, why are we talking about Korea? Uh, all you have to do is read a few tweets to figure that out. Because increasingly, it has been the focus of this administration, the current administration, to put a great deal of emphasis on our resolution of Korean issues by placing China in the central position in those issues. And so that is a very important thing for us to address. And this is why we have Isaac here today. Uh, Isaac actually is just finishing writing a novel uh, and the novel, interestingly, now I said novel, not, you know, fact-finding book, not a historical book. The, the novel, I gather, Isaac, will include, among others, Donald Trump and uh, President Kim. There's so little we know about what goes on in either of those two men's heads that it was fun <laughs> to be able to look at it from a fictional perspective and, you know, sort of allow of the other side of my brain to take root, you know, the fact side, and then taking the fiction side out in the fancy. Now, is this going to be what you hope will happen, what you fear will happen, or some combination? <laughs> Total. It's, uh, the book is pretty depressing, so <laughs> it's very much a situation that I fear. Uh, it also ends in 2011, so before a lot of this new madness. But, oh. yeah, I, I hope calmer and cooler and non-Trumpian heads prevail. So we'll see. Um, we will look forward to the publication when that comes out. Thank you. Um, perhaps you could start by addressing something of the background of what you think China can do uh, with respect to the current nuclear issues that the United States and China and the rest of the world are facing with respect to Korea. Could you give us some background of what led to those and where we are now? I think as we're getting started, a really good way to think about China and North Korea is to imagine a robber holding a gun up to his own head and saying, stop or I'll shoot. So North Korea has, the, the biggest weapon North Korea has in relation to China is the threat of its own collapse, which would be very problematic for China for a lot of ways, which I can get into later. But I think that's kind of a good background for where China and North Korea are. And it's funny to watch the two countries talk to each other because sometimes you still see lip service being paid to this old idea of you know, the Korean Workers' Party and the Communist Party is close and lips and teeth and kind of this like very old uh, communist uh, love fest in a way. But I think there's a lot of resentment on both sides. I think we tend to forget just how, how proud the North Koreans are and how frustrating it is to them that they have to listen to China uh, for anything or really have to listen to anyone outside of North Korea. And I think there's a lot of frustration on the Chinese side that North Korea won't listen to China, which to many Chinese eyes is, is so clearly more sophisticated, superior, mm -hmm. more engaged with the world. So a little yeah. upstart, huh? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed when you were talking about those issues, a little bit about the background, uh, that the question, you didn't directly address the nuclear question. Mm. Uh, I get a sense, and I, from the press at least, and from the public statements of the various governments, that China doesn't seem to be as concerned about the nuclear issue as we seem to be. Is that true? I think so, because... You know, if the easy reason is North Korea doesn't threaten to nuke China, and it's very difficult to think of a situation where North Korea would 
launch a nuke at China or even threaten to do so. Uh, I think the other thing is that China is a lot less worried about the status quo than we are. So they're saying things, they're urging all parties to uh, find restraints, but they also don't, you know, they have a lot more to lose if North Korea were to collapse, and they gain a lot more by the current situation than the United States does, which has a big strategic distraction with North Korea. The other issue about denuclearization is that China says denuclearization of the peninsula. You know, mm. we talk about North Korea not having nukes. They talk about the peninsula not having nukes because they don't want this to incentivize South Korea to have nukes, and they don't want the U.S. to return its nuclear umbrella uh, so that includes South Korea. So there's different you know, overlapping but different phrases that they use when they talk about the situation. You, you said that China likes the current situation better than we do. What is it about the current situation that China likes? So I think the advantages of the current situation for China is that, A, people outside of China. So there, there's this wonderful game that China has been playing with regards to North Korea, which is convincing America that North Korea is America's problem and not China's problem. They really have done a very sophisticated, very excellent job of shifting the term of the debate. You know, it's not an issue of, oh, how does China have to handle this recalcitrant, aggressive neighbor on its border? It's how can China help the United States? How can China contribute? Uh, with China, you know, there's very little China can do. China doesn't have control over North Korea. But yeah, I guess we could help along with sanctions in exchange, perhaps, if you guys are a little calmer on Taiwan and issues like that. So that's a big advantage for China of mm -hmm. the current situation. The second is that there's so much attention paid to the North Korean threat that people don't talk about the China threat. And I'm not here to hype this idea that the U.S. and China are destined for war or Thucydides trap or any of that other, you know, kind of conversations or threads that people have been addressing. It's just that China is the only country that has the potential to rival the U.S. for dominance. North Korea obviously doesn't. It's 25 million people, incredibly poor. Uh, you know, Middle East, Iran doesn't. Even Russia doesn't. Russia is a middling, declining power. That's a lot in the news for what it's done over the election, but does not compete with China. So the question of whether or not the U.S. and China will go into open conflict is an impossible one to answer now. I mean, who knows? We can't predict the future. But with all this attention on North Korea, we're not actually thinking strategically in the United States about how the two countries might come into more friction, might have more tense situations in the future, because we're having a conversation, a national conversation about North Korea. You started that answer by saying that the, the current narrative about this being a U.S. problem rather than a Chinese problem uh, is favorable to China. Uh, I, the obverse of that is it's unfavorable to the U.S. What, what do you think the narrative should be from the United States perspective? I think the narrative should be that North Korea is a nuclear nation that does not pose a threat to the United States. And that the more we can ignore them, the smaller the problem will be. I mean, that was the great secret behind strategic patience. And North Korea is this small, isolated country in Northeast Asia that keeps saying, hey, guys, hey, look at me. I got nukes. I got nukes. Pay me money. And the, the mouse, best... The mouse that roared. Yes, right. and then the best thing to do with that is, is to ignore them. And I think the United States has had plenty of opportunities to ignore them over history and to de-escalate tensions. And I think they did that quite well. You know, in, uh, I think it was 1971 or 72, North Korea shot down a U.S. Uh, spy plane, killing, I, I want to say, two, three dozen Americans on board. And Nixon considered responding with nuclear weapons. Thankfully, he didn't. He basically ignored it. And that was that. You know, in the late 60s, North Korea seized a U.S. ship, the Pueblo. Uh, they captured the roughly 70 crew members tortured some of them, killed one of them. Johnson thought about escalating the conflict, responding in a very, very muscular way. He decided not to, and the United States was better for it. Its interests were better served. So North Korea is going to keep having these kind of provocations, 
that's what North Korea does. But we lose by engaging with them, by playing with them on their own level. And that's one of the big problems with what Trump is doing. Mm-hmm. You know, North Korea, the way North Korea speaks is not a good rubric for international diplomacy. You know, Trump shouldn't be trying to out North Korea North Korea because we have so much more to lose. And it's a great strategy for when you can completely forgo development or openness or happiness for your own people in the expense of national interest, but it's not a great strategy for a country like the United States. Mm-hmm. The uh, narrative that you say that you would be better for the United States would seem to be one that the current administration is trying to foster in its relationship with China. So Trump meets Xi Jinping, and he comes out and saying, this is really China's problem, and China, we're really trying to get China to do things. If that's a more favorable narrative for the U.S., what, if anything, is wrong with the way it's being carried out? I think the problem is that Trump and a lot of people in the U.S. government thinks we're in a situation where we can tell China what to do. And that ship has sailed. We, we are not in that era anymore where the U.S. is the senior partner in the relationship. I mean, we are fast approaching parity on a lot of levels. And I think people forget the optics of Trump saying to China or saying, I got China's got to do this. You know, China's got to behave. It sounds very patronizing. And one can imagine how Trump would respond if Xi Jinping said, listen, this is what Trump's got to do about North Korea and he's going to do it or else. You know, it's hard for a leader of a major country or indeed any country, but especially one that's so important now as China to just swallow that and say, oh, yeah, okay, of course, I'm just going to do whatever this other head of state says because I'm so clearly the junior partner in this relationship. That's, I think, the major problem with the way it's being delivered. The other problem is that we are losing bargaining chips by asking China for help in something that we shouldn't have to ask them for help about. Uh, Bannon, before he was deposed, uh, did an interview with the American Prospect where he talked about the idea of trading Chinese support for North Korea for less American support for Taiwan. I think this is a terrible idea, not only because of America's relationship with Taiwan, but especially because we don't need to trade for China's support for North Korea. Now, there's ways that we can get it by shifting the terms of the debate, by stepping back from the situation, or frankly, which would probably be even better, having dialogue with the North Koreans, accepting that they're a nuclear power, uh, doing this big Trump goes to Pyongyang trip so that he can you know, feel good about himself and also calm, uh, calm down the situation. And that makes it, okay, North Korea is not America's problem anymore. We're going to try to bring them into the international space. And that, I think, is a better solution than what we're doing right now. So the, the answer, you say, is deference to China to some extent. Um, it's a question of language. It's a question of leaving it to someone else. Is this administration capable of that? You know, it's funny. People, when I do events like this, people will ask, oh, well, you know, what should China do in this situation? And I can give advice you know, from the limited perspective I have, but there's so many realities about like, the way the standing committee works and the way Beijing and Xi govern that mean they wouldn't take my advice. And, and there's similar things with Trump. You know, I can say, hey, this is what Trump should do, but he's not going to suddenly stop tweeting. You know, we can say, okay, listen, Trump should calm down. This is not the right way to practice diplomacy. And, you know, I can say that and everyone can say that, but until something else changes, that's still the way things are going to happen. So we sort of have to nibble around the edges a bit more. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's turn to China's view of these issues for a moment, Mm -hmm. Uh, in particular China's views about North Korea. Uh, What do you see as China's major concerns and policy, broad policy uh, uh, targets with respect to North Korea? I think there, and it's going to be interesting to see if we're going to have a more assertive push from China now that the Party Congress is over and it appears she is more able to say, okay, this is what I think we should be doing 
doing towards North Korea. But I, I think it's, you know, it, it's somewhat akin to U.S. relationship with Cuba. I think China feels that North Korea is firmly, deeply within their sphere of influence and that policy about North Korea, you know, is this is part of the general East Asian strategy of how do we not have to deal with a threat from uh, Japan and how do we reunify with Taiwan? I mean, I think if North Korea weren't making such a big deal, uh, you know, weren't mm-hmm. doing the mass at Roar thing, then it would be, you know, part of it would be, okay, what's a good economic strategy here? Uh, China's three northeastern provinces used to be you know, sort of drivers of the economy, uh, kind of big Rust Belt states like Ohio, like parts of New York, parts of Pennsylvania, and haven't grown as fast as other provinces for the last, I want to say, about 10 years or so. So if North Korea can develop, then this will be really good for economic growth and social stability in the Northeast provinces. Uh, it's also what's preventing South Korea from being able to ship goods over land to Eurasia. So there's a lot of economic opportunity if China can get North Korea to develop. I think also a good outcome for them when we're thinking about policies is, well, how do we nudge North Korea? You know, if we if the status quo for some reason becomes untenable, or if we you know want to shift to a less risky strategy with playing this game with the United States, how do we move North Korea so it's something like Cambodia or Nepal? Uh, yes, it'll probably always have nuclear weapons uh, until there's regime change, but how do we make it into a buffer state between us and a potentially uh, potential threat of a democratic neighbor, and how do we calm it down, and how do we have it be on our side? Mm-hmm. Are there other regional concerns you think China has here? I think with North Korea, there's... So, one smart way that Japan and the United States have been trying to get China to do what it wants to do on North Korea is by building up their militaries and using North Korea as an excuse. So I remember uh, interviewing the Japanese defense minister a few years ago, you know, right before, uh, right behind a poster of the Korean Peninsula, and he talked a lot about the North Korean threat in Japan building its military because of the North Korean threat. And I think everyone realizes that it's not about North Korea, it's about China. China is the actual threat to Japan. And yet, by not saying it, uh, it's a lot safer for everyone, really. You know, it gives the Chinese an excuse to not raise tensions. It gives the Japanese an excuse to not raise tensions. But it also allows Japan to sort of, I don't want to say narrow the gap because it's unclear who has better military capabilities, but it's, a, it's something that's nice for the Japanese to hide behind and for the Americans as well. You know, the Americans, you know, with, with this THAAD system, um, which the Chinese for some reason have been really, really against, uh, America just keeps saying, yeah, this is because of North Korea. And the subtlety, the, you know, the, the significance of the point of that is, well, if you're not doing what we want you to do with North Korea, we're going to keep putting our tools and our toys closer and closer to you because of North Korea. Mm-hmm. Sort of along the lines of that, um, you mentioned earlier Russia and China and Russia's attitude toward uh, North Korea. In what way is the U.S. position on North Korea impacting Sino-Soviet, sorry, not Soviet, Sino-Russian uh, relationships today? I think with North Korea, Russia is serving as a, in many ways, a diplomatic proxy for China. And they're in their UN security votes, you know, Russia is being a little bit more aggressive and a little bit more open towards trade uh, with North Korea, taking up a little bit of the slack. And I don't know if that's causing resentment in the Kremlin, you know, about Russia having to play this this very junior role. But I, I think they've managed to negotiate that pretty well, at least on the outside. So. I guess on that point, it does seem like it's been positive for Sino-Russian relations. I think there's a lot of worries in Russia about Chinese territorial or influence expansion into the Far East, into Siberia. It's not something I hear Chinese discuss, and I don't think it's any sort of Chinese strategy. 
but there is a worry that you know China will start eyeing some of that territory, and you know North Korea sort of gets at some of those issues. Um, if there's going to be a resolution of the nuclear issue, well, of the North Korean issues generally, because it isn't necessarily only nuclear bombs, it could be regular bombs being driven on, dropped on South Korea or Japan or China. Um, is there an element of the U.S.'s concerns about North Korea and China's concerns about the North Korea that overlap and make some joint effort possible? What I think the best solution for both of them is a North Korea that's not an international pariah. Now, I think the difficulty is finding a way to get there, but the U.S. and China both benefit if North Korea is a member of the international community. And I think the United States has a lot more to do on that. You know, that that's the United States' onus to go and meet with North Korea and to, you know, again, not care so much about past provocations, to, to forgive North Korea in, in a way. Uh, you know, I think that would be the best solution and, and probably the easiest way out. I mean, I think the North Korea has said so many crazy things over the years. Remember, there's this little... Uh, kerfuffle when a uh, North Korean official said that Trump's comments were an act of war. And a lot of people were worried, oh my God, North Korea is going to declare war in the United States. They used that phrase dozens of times uh, in the last 15 years. They used it so much that The Onion, uh, 11 years ago, wrote an article about how Kim Jong-il interprets the sunrise as an act of war. And this is just something that they say. So I, I think... <laughs> We have to realize that North Korea says all of these crazy, absurd things, and that if we can mollify some of their strategic concerns and not see them as a threat, even though they threaten to nuke us, then I, I think there's a nicer way forward. Now you said, well, this, what does that mean, though? Does that mean that you, you come to accept the nuclear capability of North Korea or that you denuclearize? Or how do you reach... How, how do you change North Korea from being a pariah? I think there's, so there's two ways to deal with the nuclear situation. It's sort of like uh, in, in Buddhism, this idea of like, how do you want less? You know, you can either get what you want or not want it in the first place, right? So how do we deal with North Korea's nukes? We can either get rid of the nukes, which is very, very difficult uh, and risks a catastrophic war, or we can not care about them having nukes. You know, plenty of countries have nukes. Pakistan is a nuclear country that, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that Pakistan has nukes, but the idea of getting rid of nukes from Pakistan is a lot more worrying and a lot more difficult than just living in an imperfect world where Pakistan has nuclear capability. So it's just funny to me to listen to U.S. officials talk about, you know, we're going to stop North Korea before they, before they nuclearize. Guys, North Korea has nuclear weapons. Like, that, that ship has sailed. You know, we lost that battle 15 years ago, uh, or however long ago. And I, I think this, you know, this idea that, oh, we have to stop them before they can miniaturize a warhead is both very cruel to the people of South Korea, who have long been able to be decimated by North Korea's conventional weapons, its chemical weapons, its biological weapons, but also the tens of thousands of Americans who live in South Korea, Japan, and frankly to the North Korean people who you know, really don't get a place in this debate. But you know, when we sort of talk about the humanitarian, uh, you know, the humanitarian side of, of this issue, oh, are, are we going to risk denuclearizing North Korea? What are the potential consequences? You know, it's a lot of conversation about them nuking California or sending you know, missiles into Seoul. I think we also have to remember that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of North Koreans could die too. And I think one of the problems with, and a very mild rant here, one of the problems with American perception of North Korea is that people seem to see the country as a cartoonishly evil leader, goose-stepping soldiers, and victims, but not realizing that they are people, that they are humans. And yes, you know, like anyone who, or most people who study the country and have been there, it is one of the world's most horrifying, awful places. The regime is terrible. I fully agree with that. But that doesn't give us the right 
to go and, and cause the deaths of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of North Koreans either. Um, has the U.S.-Chinese relationship with respect to North Korea impacted other aspects of our relationship? You know, I think it has in ways that it shouldn't. We have started to see the U.S.-China relationship through the lens of North Korea. And that is so not the way to do it. And there's so many more important aspects of the U.S.-China relationship than just what is China doing about North Korea. So I think it's had that effect. I think that's probably probably the major one. It's become the dominant element. Right, right. I, mean, I remember uh, there's a um, graffiti on a garbage can near where I live that says, North Korea is going to kill us all. And mm -hmm. it's just it's sort of funny to see that, okay, like there's actually a lot of fear among Americans about North Korea. And you can understand why politicians are talking about it and why it's become such an issue, but it, it really shouldn't. You know, it really doesn't need to. You mentioned the, the history going back and the issues being resolved 15 years ago, particularly on the nuclear side. It seemed that in that in earlier administrations that China and the UN actually were able to work together and come up with some sort of a solution, how unperfect it may have proven to be. Do you see a difference in our relationship today that's making U.S.-Chinese cooperation on North Korea more difficult? There's uh, two major differences. Well, three. Uh, one is that China, you know, compared to 10, 20, 30 years ago, when, where whenever you're taking a snapshot, this economy is you know, two, three, five, six times larger than it was. It's a far more important global player and feels far less of a need to listen to the United States. Second is that back in 94, back in the 90s, you know, North Korea didn't have the same capability that it had today. So there was actually possibility of denuclearization or the possibility of at least freezing the program until you know, something, something more permanent uh, came into place. And then the third major difference is Trump. You know, Trump is very unpredictable. He's very inexperienced. He's very impulsive and just makes everything we're going through with regards to North Korea a lot more difficult than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. This is a question we didn't preview ahead of time, but I'll ask it anyway because it's, it's very current. Have you seen any developments out of the party Congress that just ended that you think might have an impact on either China's attitude toward Korea or the U.S.? So one of the reasons I started looking into North Korea was because it was a break from Chinese opacity uh, at the high levels. So North Korea is a much more difficult country to understand uh, and, and not to understand, but it's a much more opaque place, you know, the, the way that they keep information very closed. Uh, the top of the Chinese Communist Party is also incredibly opaque, incredibly frustrating, and very, very difficult to understand, you know, in some ways by design, in some ways by incompetence, um, both on the party's end and on my end. Um, but, you know, North Korea is, you know, no one really knows what's going on. Um, so I'm explaining that as a jumping off point to say that there were things that Xi Jinping said during his speeches that um, you know, makes one think China will be more assertive internationally. But it's hard to know if that's actually going to happen because we don't have a sophisticated understanding of how North Korea policy or frankly policy is made on the standing committee. So, you know, we... I think it was this current standing committee. There was uh, one of the members has a degree from Kim Il Sung University, uh, which is the best university in North Korea. If anyone's uh, anyone's curious, uh, and you know, ha does that have any effect on Chinese policy towards North Korea? Who knows? You know, I certainly don't know, and I haven't seen you know any sort of convincing explanation one way or the other. So I guess that's a, just a long-winded way of saying I have no idea. Getting off the Korea issue just for a moment, um, apart from the North Korean uh, questions involved, uh, where do you see U.S.-Chinese relations standing at the moment? I think that it, it feels we are on the cusp of some sort of breakthrough. And whether that breakthrough is a major concession 
that the United States gives China for North Korea, whether that breakthrough is a trade war, or whether that breakthrough is increased perception in the United States that, hey, China could unseat the United States from its position as the most important country in the world, and perhaps we should start having a national debate about it. It's hard to say, but it does feel like, and we were talking about this a little bit before, it does feel like we're one or two scandals in the United States away from China really being a part of the national conversation. You know, it's fascinating. I don't know if uh, any of the, the you know, Chinese diplomats who are here have sort of picked up on this, but uh, China plays such a smaller role in American public consciousness than I feel like probably most people in this room feel like it should. And frankly, objectively, probably can say it should. I mean, there, there's so much more attention paid to Russia uh, and the Middle East. And the people who are paying attention to China tend to be the business people um, because of the money and the Pentagon because of the potential military threat and because the China is the best excuse for increasing a military budget. You know, it's much easier to say, okay, China's a threat. We should buy a lot more, you know, ships and missiles and planes than to say, hey, we have to deal with men uh, with Kalashnikovs in the desert somewhere. And so we need fancier drones. So those are the, those are the groups that I feel are, you know, and, and us and, you know, people who do these kind of things. But I, I feel like in terms of a community-wide issue, it's business people and, uh, and the military. And it hasn't really come into the forefront for, you know, the quote-unquote average American man on the street you know, I think they're a lot more aware of Russia, you know, a lot more aware of Israel, Middle East, of those issues than they are with U.S.-China relations. Mm -hmm. And I would predict that at some point fairly soon, you know, almost certainly in Xi's next term and potentially in Trump's term, we're going to see that shift. Uh, for a long time, there were very senior people in the Department of State who were really knowledgeable clear thinking and brilliance of uh, students of Chinese-American relations who could try and keep China in the forefront. We don't seem to have that now because of the understaffing of all the positions not being filled. Have you seen anything that you think is being impacted in U.S.-China relations by that lack of attention? You know, it's hard to know whether or not that was good for U.S. policy. So, you know, at the highest levels, Beijing would like to have a man on the inside, you know, Kissinger, Paulson, um, you know, people that were friends of China. And they're very, very good at steering these people so that, you know, and they were not in any ways mouthpieces for, right. for China, but they were, you know, they were friends. They were on the right side. They understand the importance of the relationship. They understand that China's rise was peaceful. They understood the, you know, the way to communicate that. And we don't have anyone who's doing that right now. And perhaps uh, Jared and Ivanka are, who knows what, what's going on with them. Uh, but I, I think well, so. Well, there's this mall in Beijing they want to build. Them. Oh, there we go. That's... <laughs> so I, I think the, you know, that there's, we don't seem to have that channel of communication right now. It's kind of interesting to see if, if um, Bannon is going to, in some way, play that role. He met with Wang Qishan in yeah. Beijing not too long ago. Bannon's not officially part of the White House. Wang Qishan is not part of the Central Committee uh, starting now. But, you know, Bannon could still, in some ways, act as a go-between. And he, you know, it, it, it's kind of interesting to watch, you know, because he's someone who's so, who's very, very, firm and aggressive views about what China has done to America, it'll be funny to watch if he softens those views and if there is this sort of influence campaign happening against Bannon right now, you know, letting him meet with the people at the top of the party and making him feel like he's someone who's very important, whether or not they're able to manipulate maybe too strong of a word, but to uh, convince him of the importance of the U.S.-China relationship, uh, like the Chinese have been so successful in doing uh, with Kissinger as, as the best example, but other people, um, minor and major, who play important roles in the relationship. Okay, uh, that was 
very interesting, and we would like to keep it interesting. And so we would encourage anyone in the audience who has a question. Do we have a, yeah, we have a mic. So if you would, if you have a question, please raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you. And if you could wait for the mic to ask your question, please identify yourself and who you're with and then ask the question. And please, it's a question, not a speech. Okay. First, where, where are you nearest? Why don't you start with that gentleman there? Okay. Hi, I'm Robert Blum. I'm a uh, contributor to the Nelson Report, as you probably know about. Um, John DeJong, I believe, is the man. Yes, yes, you're right. Number two. Um, I think North Korea is important to the Chinese for two strategic yeah, reasons. Yeah, it's on. It's just... I should probably just put my uh, get closer to it. I think North Korea is important. Uh, to China for two strategic reasons. One, I'll call plausible, uh, a, a deniable, as a deniable proxy. In other words, North Korea can threaten the United States. China doesn't have to do that overtly. Russia doesn't have to do that overtly. They have the North Koreans conveniently playing that role, and it's deniable, unlike Cuba, because what we have is a Korean, miss, a Korean missile crisis, basically, like we had a Cuban missile crisis striking the United States. But Cuba was a, 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 a um, not a an undeniable proxy. My second point is um, relates to the uh, Korean War, the origins. China is a divided country. North Korea is a divided country. China needs North Korea as a bargaining chip to unify China. They say the US, well, you're supporting Taiwan. So, okay, we'll give up North Korea. We'll allow the Koreas to unify, but you gotta let China unify. The reason I think that's important is at the very beginning of the Korean War, the US's first move or the invasion was to send the Seventh Fleet to the Taiwan Straits because Mao had troops in Fujian ready to move on Taiwan just as the North Koreans had come to, had, had, had crossed the, the, the parallel. So, and, and, then, and then he moved his troops. Once, he, once the re reaction came, he moved the troops, once the 7th Leroy, he moved the troops up to the northeast, poised eventually to intervene in the North Korean Sir, situation. Can we have your question, please? Yeah, so, so that's my second question, that, that, that China, sorry, North Korea is, is, is an indispensable I, 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 bargaining yeah. chip for the reunification of China uh, and the point going back to the very origins of the Korean yeah, War, which I believe you, was predicated on the universe. And, you know, it, it came about because China was refused entry in the United Nations. That's why Russia okay, boycotted. So go ahead. Let's hear Isaac's thoughts on Thank that. You. I just, I'll just very briefly, I like the idea of a deniable proxy, and I might even borrow that if you don't mind. But, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your points. Uh, why don't you get that gentleman over there, and then we'll go to the other side. Tyler Potter, International Trade at PwC. Um, I wonder what your thoughts are of, in this instance, the failure of democracy to produce an effective foreign policy tool, whereas, you know, from the perspective of China, you see that they have a very effective strategic thinking when it comes to international relations. What is effective uh, in the U.S. government right now, and what can act as a counterbalance to Trump's tweeting and his feeding to the constituency fear. That's a great point. I think we give China way too much credit for an effective foreign policy and for sophisticated decision making and for streamlined bureaucracy. I think there's so much waste and fear and backbiting that happens at every level of every Chinese ministry that we just don't see. And so we give them credit that they don't deserve. I think one example of that is the times when China will say, like with Pakistan, oh yeah, we're going to invest $80 billion in Pakistan. You know, we're going to invest this much, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And the examples that we see and we hear about are the times when they actually do it, as opposed to the many, many times when they don't. You know, if you go back and dig with the actual amount of state investment that China does in Pakistan, it's far lower than they say. But, you know, it's easy for us in the media to seize on these numbers, $80 billion, this shows the success of One Belt, One Road or the success of, of Chinese strategy. Um, and in terms of effective U.S. policy towards China, I think the things that we can do are you know, take advantage of, and, and this sounds a little hokey, I don't mean it to be, but take advantage of the actual goodwill that Chinese and Americans feel for each other. And people-to-people -people contact, you know, keeping 
every sort of lines of communication open, I think is very important. And you know, just like people from countries that are in worse situations than America don't represent the views of their government and have to often apologize for their leaders, we are getting to that place too where we have to say, listen, like this is what my government says. Uh, this is not how I believe. And you know, many people in America actually want this or this to happen. So I think that's a more effective way of us being, you know, people-to-people diplomacy, so to speak. Okay, uh, Mr. Starbers. Hi, I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. Uh, do you think there's any concern in China that if they were to press too hard on North Korea and uh, Kim Jong-il really got desperate, that he might threaten China itself with his nukes? I don't think so. I I haven't heard anyone worry about that. And I I think the Chinese are a lot more afraid of a North Korean collapse because that has a lot of very easy to see dangers. You have refugees fleeing across the border. Modern China has never had to deal with a refugee crisis. This could potentially be a major one. You have North Korea's stockpile of weapons potentially getting in the hands of Uyghur separatists or Tibetan independence fighters. You, know, you have the U.S. marching its troops beyond the parallel. And you also have the possibility of a resurgent Korean nationalism. So there's millions of ethnic Koreans in China today. Uh, they don't want to, you know, they're, they're not in the same kind of independence or autonomy boat that a lot of that the Uyghurs or Tibetans are, in part because they don't want to be part of North Korea. You know, there, there's no kind of big demand for them to have a greater Korea because that would involve them being part of North Korea. If the country were to collapse and then revive itself, you could see greater Korean nationalism in Northeast China, which would also be a problem for Beijing. So I think they're much more focused on the country not falling apart than they are worried about Kim Jong-un directing his nukes at China. Thank you. Yan Chen from Momentum Advisors. Uh, you compared the two options that, you know, one is getting rid of the nuclear weapon in uh, North Korea and second, living with it. So my question is, uh, what is your view on um, the role of Japan mm-hmm. and um South Korea in this second scenario, whether you know that will provoke these two countries to develop their own nuclear weapon, which China definitely will not like, especially in the case of Japan? I think what China needs to do and what it hasn't been doing is convince uh, South Korea and Japan that its intentions are good. And I, I think, you know, I was, I was talking earlier about the goodwill between Americans and Chinese. Unfortunately, there's a lot of really bad will among Japanese and Chinese. And there's a lot of worry, I think, in both countries that, or, I mean, I worry in Japan, rather, and then kind of uh, the, this very disturbing desire among many Chinese I've spoken to to get revenge against Japan for World War II. So I, I think in order for China to not have to worry about uh, South Korea and especially Japan to renuclearize, it's going to have to go a long way to calming tensions you know, between China and Japan. And we're talking about, oh, like, you know, what's your advice for Trump? Uh, very simple advice here for China. Calm down on the anti-Japanese war dramas. Uh, that there's so many of these, and they really pervert people's uh, views of what Japan is like. They're just, you know, I was talking about Americans' cartoonishly evil view of Kim Jong-un. Some Chinese develop that after watching these dramas that just show Japanese as cartoonishly evil soldiers killing innocent Chinese people. And that's really bad for relations between the country, and a lot of that's government-sponsored. And I think it'd be helpful if they stopped pushing those. Let's go with that. Uh, Herbert Levin. Uh, many uh, Chinese officials uh, over the years have been sent by the Chinese government to study in the U.S. Uh, they get degrees at Harvard and the Fletcher School and so forth. Uh, some of them got in trouble during the Cultural Revolution, but then they have popped back. Do you find the uh, the, the, the Chinese who 
come back to China from the US, do you find they are still in a lot of very significant positions or do you find that they have been uh, pushed off to other things? That's the first question. And the second uh, question is uh, the Chinese journalists cannot uh, run a lot of articles, but they know a great deal and they are wonderful sources of information and they like to talk. Uh, do you find them as well informed as they were in the past? Yes, great questions. Uh, the second one first, because it's easier. Yes, definitely. Uh, that's basically exactly how I describe it. They are very intelligent, very well sourced, often very frustrated by their inability to not report what they want to report. So, I mean, the, the reason that so much of what Americans understand about China comes from Americans is because what Chinese journalists are allowed to publish is, in a lot of ways, garbage. Uh, you know, just turgid, recycled propaganda that Americans don't want to read, nor should they have to read. Yet, actually speaking with the Chinese journalists, they, a lot of times, have very well-informed, very interesting, very nuanced views of what's going on in China. And being locals and speaking, you know, obviously speaking the language and having a deep understanding of the place makes them great sources. So, yes, agree completely with that point. It seems like more recently there are less uh, returning Chinese in high positions. I haven't run the numbers. My guess would be that this recently announced central committee has less people who've spent time overseas than other ones have. And I, I think part of it is this, I don't I mean, yeah, I guess I, I guess I will say totalitarian turn that China has been taking and this idea that, you know, things outside, the party is, is becoming, it seems more paranoid of things outside it. So that if you go and you spend time abroad and you have, a lot more foreign friends, then you're a lot more suspect. And I think another reason is that, you know, the I think the best predictor of a Chinese person, a Chinese person's success at the top levels of the party is whether or not they went to Beida or Tsinghua, the two top schools in China. So if they studied abroad and, you know, undergrad Harvard, PhD at Harvard, um, they certainly got a better education. Uh, I can say that firmly, but they don't have the same network that they would have if they had bunked, you know, with Xi Jinping, for example. <laughs> Any of those? Yeah. Um, well, we'll great talk, thank you. Uh, real quick question. Um, if and when our administration decides to strike a deal and goes to negotiate with, uh, with Kim, because of the recent decision made with Iran, how is that going to, you know, really take up any credibility into what type of terms that he's going to really kind of uh, conjure up out there? You know, I, I think it makes it more difficult that we're going back on a deal or you know, trying to walk back a deal that we already made. But I, I think what makes this more possible is I think the North Koreans, because they do it themselves, have a pretty good ability to ignore all of the craziness and bluster and things that happened in the past and focus on the present. I mean, if we were going to go into a deal with the North Koreans and we had to take them at face value, we would never get there because of all the things they say. So I, I think the North Koreans, if we can convince them, can understand that the situation is different, the situation is special, just like the North Koreans can convince us the same thing. So I guess put it a little bit more crudely, um, both Trump and the North Koreans are very comfortable lying. And I think if they can have a meeting of the minds over that and realize, oh, yeah, this was all in the past. You know, it's sort of like, I mean, Trump has this amazing ability to believe that the truth is, is for him to create, is, is what he says. And the North Koreans sort of have that, too. So I, I think that, in some ways, makes it more likely for them to come together. They just have to create the same thing. Does this work? All right, Tom DeLuca, Fordham University. Um, I was wondering, you, uh, you seem to think that um, if we just sort of step back or be cool, maybe as Obama would say, right, that with, with the North Korea, we'd actually be strategically in a better position. But what do you make of uh, arguments such as, well, maybe Kim's end game is to reunify the Korean Peninsula? And so one reason to have nuclear weapons, not only to protect itself, but to get the U.S. nuclear umbrella 
away from South Korea, uh, with all the miscalculation that could be involved there. Yeah. So I was just wondering what scenarios you think that are, are, are quite dangerous with uh, the, the Kim regime having a large number of nuclear weapons, particularly those that could hit uh, the United States. I think with the caveat that um, we have no idea what Kim Jong-un is thinking, uh, it seems much more likely that he doesn't view that as a goal, if only because it's so unrealistic. And it'd be hard to imagine, you know, the U.S. doesn't officially have a nuclear umbrella over South Korea, and yet the U.S. and South Korea have a very tight defense strategy. So it's hard to imagine a scenario where the United States just walks back all of its commitments towards South Korea, allowing North Korea to successfully invade. Rather, I think there's a way to, for the U.S. to assure North Korea of its own security to assure the North Koreans that we don't want regime change, which will allow Kim Jong-un to focus on his stated priorities, which is national development and you know, more happiness for his own people. Okay. Hi, uh, my, my name is Chris. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Um, my own understanding on this is, is dated by a few years, but my understanding going back uh, quite a few years is that in track two and in, in seemingly other settings when the U.S. side has tried to bring the conversation to practical steps of what would happen in Korea uh, after uh, the, the deposition of a Kim regime, that generally there's been a resistance to having that conversation. In September, there was a piece published by an academic from Beida that laid out sort of the, the, the skeleton of, of what that conversation would be like and basically said what you would expect, only that they would accept also the United States coming in and actually picking up the weapon, but, but other, other than that, it's largely what you would expect. Uh, I'm curious if there's anything you can tell me about uh, how high and how far those practical discussions ever got before the end of the Obama administration, if there necessarily was discontinuity in those talks after the end of the Obama administration, and if you've picked up any other indications that there are people in Beijing that are planning practically for what happens after, after the Kim uh, regime is done. So that's a great question, and seeing as this is a public conversation, um, I will say that my understanding is that the Chinese are frustrated in these conversations by America's inability to convincingly promise that in the case of a unified Korean Peninsula, the U.S. won't advance its troops closer to China's border. And there was a situation uh, with NATO and Russia where the U.S. said one thing and then ended up doing another thing. And I think the Chinese either believe that the U.S. would do the same thing or use that as an excuse in negotiations. But as far as I know, uh, there haven't been deep, high-level conversations between the Chinese and the U.S. side over how to handle what would happen in the case of a collapse of the regime. Um, they, they certainly might be happening, and perhaps that's something that Trump and she will address. But... Beyond that, that's, yeah, about all, all I can say. This gentleman here. Hello, Miles Matthews, Global Trade. Do you see North and South Korea ever reunifying the way East and West Germany did, which would then employ the people manual, you know, the manual labor in North Korea with the sophistication in South Korea? I think and that's, a, that's a really important point. So my understanding, and I haven't been to South Korea in a while, but my understanding from reading and talking to people who, who are there is that there's very little desire in South Korea to have to go through the economic hardship that would be required to integrate North Korea. It's so much further behind than East Germany was at the time of unification. So on the one hand, North Korea probably has huge mineral riches, and reunifying with North Korea is the only way for Korea to ever possibly be a great power. You know, South Korea itself will never be a great power. Possibly with the full Korean peninsula, they could one day rival Japan. But it seems right now, leaving what the North Koreans think entirely out of the picture, that there's very little desire on the South Korean side to have to go through that. Anybody over here? No? Okay. Let's Is uh, uh, Wilbur Ross uh, looked upon as someone in the uh, Trump administration who has a particular interest in China and is thought of to know something uh, uh, perhaps a bit more than some of the others? I think he certainly is. And he, you know, there's an FT piece a few months ago about him pushing for a deal 
with the Chinese over, I think it was over steel tariffs and Trump overruling him at the last minute. But I think Wilbur Ross is you know, sort of trying to find his place between you know, the Navarro, Bannon, Millers on one side and Cones uh, on the other side. And, you know, from what I can tell, he's somewhat respected by Trump. And I think in this administration uh, is, is a moderate in a lot of ways, but I think he is viewed, if not, you know, like, like Paulson was in any way as like a China guy, but as someone who has a pretty good understanding of what goes on in China. Okay. So this will be our last question. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Bernard Gall. I'm interested in knowing what you think the BRIC nation will have any effect on the U.S. dollar or economy. Hmm. I don't think the BRIC nations are really going to be an idea for the future. You know, it, it feels like sort of a slapdash organization of a bunch of different countries with a lot of very different interests. And I, I don't think that branding is really going to last. Um, I'm definitely not a currency specialist, so I, I'm afraid I don't have anything sophisticated to say about you know, Chinese uh, UN hegemony versus US dollar hegemony. But I, I think it's something that you know, the Chinese are, you know, certainly trying to figure out a way to get more global influence through the strength of the currency. And I think it's kind of a balancing act for them about liberalizing some of the capital markets uh, and the, some of the risks that come with that versus having the, do- the yuan always play second fiddle to the dollar. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Isaac, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Thank you.